Well, good morning, friends. How are we doing? Good. Welcome, welcome. Would you stand with us if you're able this morning? Happy Easter. Thanks for joining us. My name is Miles. If we haven't met, uh, we're so glad that you joined us at Salty this morning. Uh, we're going to start out. I'm going to uh, read you a scripture from Luke 24. Uh, and it starts like this in ber verse 1. It says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed to their faces and the men said to them, get this, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he is risen. Come on, aren't you thankful for that this morning? Well, we're gonna sing some songs um, and just lift up the name of Jesus today because he's paved a way for us to have access to salvation. Um, and man, I don't know why, I don't know how you got here. I don't know why you're here. Maybe someone dragged you in this morning. But I do know that we all have this desire to be part of something bigger than ourselves. And I believe that maybe that could be the reason that you're here with us this morning, to, to have a real life encounter with the one who created you, who died for you, and who rose from the grave on this day. So as we start, I invite you to sing out with us. Here we go. Let's sing this. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? Come on. It was my tomb. Till what we say? Till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my turn. Come on. Till I met you. Let's sing this. You call my name. You call my name. I need 
I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, and I was an orphan, but what? You call me a citizen of heaven.
Jesus, we're thankful today that we can live in the promise of salvation and hope. And we have access to your love today. Let's sing this. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into That is awesome. Let's pray together. Good morning, God. Thank you for being here. 
Thank you for loving us. Thank you for calling us here. Thank you for giving us a beautiful day, and thank you for every man, woman, and child in this room and all across our campuses, and God, what you want to do in our lives today. We say and confess, as we already have, that Jesus is Christ, he is king, and he is our living hope. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. He is risen, and we celebrate that today. God, we need you. Thank you for every person in this room. God, speak to our hearts. Change us. Make us who you want us to be. We need you. We're broken people. We need your living hope. We sing all these songs and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah, give it up for God one time, one more time. And go ahead and take a seat right where you are. What an awesome, awesome day today. Beautiful day. What a great reminder that God loves you. Life is tough sometimes, but Jesus is our living hope, right? Amen. That Jesus is our living hope, right? Yeah. All right. <laughs> and good morning, Salty. Good, morning. good to see everybody here this morning. Y'all sound good. You look good. It's been a good morning so far, right? Yeah. You have life. You are here. I'm excited for you today. Thanks for being here, too. Thank you for participating in worship. Man, when you sing, it just brings it. It brings it. I'm thankful to be a part of it. When you are here too. So good morning, Salty. Thank you for being here. And welcome to Salty, especially if you're one of our guests and you've never been here before. Hey, thanks for being here. It's a great day today. I'm glad that you're here. Got a great message for you. Just really excited for you today. It's a beautiful day. One of the things I love about Salty, if you're a guest, that we love God and we love people. And we'd love to have a conversation with you about faith, about this life that we're living We'd love to pray for you, encourage you, serve you. Anything that we can do to help you, we'd love to do that for you. And the way we do that is through our digital connection card. So on the screen right there, you got that QR code. If you'd love to connect with us, and we'd love to connect with you, just take your phone out, point your camera at that QR code, and it'll bring you right where you need to go to fill out some information. And when you do, we'll receive that, and then we'll connect with you this week. And in just a few moments, you're going to have a chance to get up and move around the room and while you're doing that, if you'd prefer to do this instead, there's a sign in the back that says, Welcome, start here over your right shoulder. And there's a team back there of lovely people that would love to help you through that process so they can help you fill out that information, get you where you need to go. They got a free gift for you too. Don't miss that. But we're just glad that you're here and excited that you're here. I always want to talk to you about next steps of your faith. What's that look like? What's going on around here at Salty? April 14th, we have Discover Salty. Say Discover Salty. Yeah, Discover Salty is a conversation we have about who we are as salty people. Robbie and Christy O'Brien started this place 12 plus years ago. And so it's the story of salty and why we do what we do. And even more so, we'd love to talk to you about your journey and your life. We'd love to connect with you and hear that story that you have. So Discover Salty is that conversation. We talk about that. And it's right across the street. April 14th at 1030 at our rescue station. It's the old firehouse, if you've ever seen. It's right on the other side of Vining right there. That's where we'll meet for that at 1030. But we'd love to have you connect with us and have that conversation with you. And, again, that QR code right there can take you right where you need to go to register for that or get more information about that, too. And then self-worth is something that we all wrestle with, right? And this Wednesday, we're starting a conversation, making sense of your worth. Christy O'Brien is teaching that. It's eight weeks. And it talks about the struggles that we all face, the pains that we have in our life, the obstacles that are there, our self-worth. And talks about how to overcome that and how to be the person that God has created you to be. And so for eight weeks, we'll talk about that and have some tools, too, that you can use to find out and discover who you are in Christ and who God has created you to be to make sense of your worth. So don't miss that. Starts this Wednesday and for the next eight weeks from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock right here. So we're going to move into our connection time. Let me explain that to you, especially if you're a guest. I love this part of our service. So we take four minutes and we just kind of move around the room with intentionality. Let me explain it to you. So what's going to happen is you're going to have a four-minute countdown clock that comes up on these screens. It'll start counting down. Music will start playing. It's not musical chairs either. Music will start playing. You can get up. And move around the room, get you some coffee and donuts in the back. You don't have to get up. You can stay seated right where you are and just watch everybody else. That's cool, too. You can pray. Connect with God through prayer. 
right where you are. There's a cross up front you can use or one in the back. And then our prayer team will be right underneath this exit sign. They'd love to encourage you and pray for you. So that's another option there. On the side walls, on those tables, there's communion, the little cups with juice in it and a cracker in it too. Symbolically, Jesus said, hey, remember me when you gather together. Remember my sacrifice on the cross, my resurrected life. Remember me this way. So it's called communion. Nothing magical about it. It's just saying, thank you, God, for your love for me. So the juice is there and the cracker represents Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and his new life. So you want to receive communion? Receive communion too. And then we always talk about generosity because generosity changes yeah, it changes everything. Changes you, changes me, changes those around us. And what a better day to think about generosity than today. There's a scripture, John 3:16 that says, "God loved the world. God loved you so much that he gave Jesus his only son to die for you. And that whoever believes in him won't perish, but will have everlasting life." How big was that that God gave Jesus generosity? And what better way to show our generosity and how God has changed us than when we are generous? And when you do give, it pushes forward the mission to rescue and empower disciples for Jesus. It's a big deal. Lives are changed. And I want to say thank you every time you give. So on the side walls, again, there's a kiosk and give boxes there. You can go to saltier.org and give that way. So let me pray for you, and we'll move in our connection time. Four minutes. Just get up move around the room or stay right where you are. God, thank you so much that you are the God of hope. Good morning again, Salty Church. Yeah, good morning. Glad that you are here. And for those of you who are new and never met you before, my name is Robbie, the lead pastor here at uh, Salty Church. And we are gathered here for this teaching element of our Easter celebration. And it has been a good, good day so far. Hope that it's been good for you. But let me tell you a little bit about it as we, uh, as we get started. You know, one church in four locations. So we're in New Smyrna, we're Flagler, we're in Ormond and at the beach. But except for today, we're at the beach in Flagler and in New Smyrna and in Ormond. So we have got a lot happening, some of which I want to celebrate with you. Uh, welcome everybody who's watching live right now in Flagler Beach as uh, they are gathering uh, to worship there as they had several baptisms at the beach this morning. They have uh, seven or so, something like that. It was really cool. An important part of our team as well, uh, New Smyrna. Welcome everybody who's watching live right now in New Smyrna Beach. I heard it was a, a pretty cool event as well at, um, at the beach, as well as I think it was 27 or something baptisms. So that was really awesome. Yeah, definitely. And, and in Ormond as well. The, um, yeah, we uh, had, I think, somewhere, I see, see, 58 plus 6, so yeah, 64-ish. Every life is a story. Almost 96 total for the weekend uh, is extraordinary. Single largest baptism service we've ever had uh, as a part of a church this weekend. So it's really cool. And uh, just for fun, let me show you a video of uh, what it looked like at the beach in Ormond. And you can, we, I don't know what the count is. Maybe you can, you can um, count the heads if you want. But uh, here we go. So this is, uh, this is the beach this morning. And it was just really stacked up. Yeah. For those who got up early, it was really an amazing view. We had, the first year that I can ever remember, the low tide was almost exactly the time we started our worship service, which was cool, and the sun was just perfect, the crowd was amazing, and uh, it has been a good day so far, and we aren't done yet. <laughs> so there's that video. <clears throat> I want to welcome everybody also who's watching online. There are folks that join in all over the country, and uh, I will say a little, allow me a little break here in the, um, I also want to say welcome to my mom and dad who are watching uh, this morning live, so it's, um, 
Yeah, I don't always do that, but it's Easter and uh, super cool that uh, everybody's able to join us no matter where they are. As we are here on this important holy holiday, it is Easter, and I want to talk all about that. Um, but in order, to, I think, to maximize this Easter story, the good news that Jesus is alive, in order to maximize that, I want us to work through one issue that is probably maybe the most uncomfortable part of an Easter story, but, but we need to do it because it not only helps us to understand the impact of Jesus and what he did, but it really is the one word that ties us in with this holy day. The word is sacrifice. And so that's the thing we're going to spend a little bit of time on today, and I know it's uh, not exciting. It's not um, chocolate bunnies and Easter eggs. You know, sacrifice. It's not the kind of thing we enjoy talking about, but Again, it's something that we live with every day, uh, but also it is a key factor in maximizing this Easter story. So let me just draw you into the story here uh, in terms of like everyday sacrifice that you all know, you, you, you know all about it, right? So let me just illustrate a couple things. Um, how many ever of you ever have or do go to the gym? You go work out somewhere? So a good bit of number, yeah, right? More my left side than the right side. I don't know why, but okay. But, but, but you understand, right? So, so folks pay money to go to a gym to go work out and get stressed out and, you know, achy muscles and sweat and all of that kind of stuff. Why? Well, the idea, of course, is, you know, um, s sacrifice brings hope for a better future. So if you want to be healthy, you got to sacrifice some time, money, and effort along to do that. So we, we, rec we understand that. Um, you know, I, some of you are retired. The rest of us want to be retired one day. And if you want to be retired with some money in your bank account at the end, then, you know, how do you do that? Well, you've you, you got to sacrifice some of your, um, you know, you know, e existing money that you have, invest that into the future so that one day maybe, right? And so the idea, of course, sacrifice brings hope for a better future. Um, if you, 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 know, you most, many of us have children, either you already did raise kids, you got kids at home, right? Talk about sacrifice. You know, you have to feed them like every day. <laughs> and so besides what to make, you got to buy, you know, the clothes and all this kind of stuff. And, and, uh, but the sacrifice of like, you know, gymnastics and band and, you know, saving for college. And they don't even care, right? But you do it anyways, right? So why? Well, we, we hope, we sacrifice on their behalf because we hope that they will have a better future. They want them to grow up to be productive humans as they get older, right? We sacrifice daily. For those of you who are married or want to be married, you know, the Gottman Institute um, says that there are two key factors in a successful marriage that determine whether you're going to make it or not. Two key words, <laughs> kindness and generosity. So being kind and generous to one another determines the success of a long-term marriage. And so you can measure yourself out on that. But the idea is both of those things require sacrifice. Sacrifice brings hope for a better future. So you live it. You understand it. Whether you're good at it or not, it doesn't matter. It's a concept that we, we can understand. And it, it begins to help us understand what Jesus did, of course. So we need to talk about that. Because that is the, you know, the greatest sacrifice brings the greatest hope. And then it allows us to, to realize some of that hope in our own lives. So let me walk you through a couple elements as it relates to the sacrifice of Jesus. And I'm going to do it in a different kind of way because I heard um, this tidbit by uh, Jason Sobel. He's, um, he's a, he used to be a, a Jewish rabbi turned Christian. And he talks about the weight of the cross and, and the symbolism that happened in Jesus' sacrifice. So let me rewind the story a little bit. Let me tell you uh, some things maybe you hadn't thought of. So we're going to go all the way back to the beginning, like all the way to the beginning. Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Put Adam and Eve in the garden, set them up and said, hey, you guys, go for it. Do anything you want for as long as you want, and life is going to be awesome and perfect, except just don't eat from that one tree. He had to allow them a choice to honor him or not, and of course, over time, at some point, they failed. They eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and so their sin is introduced into the world. And then because of that, there are consequences to sin. And, and the con we, we feel all of that. But watch this. Some of the consequences from Genesis 3, and now it sounds like I'm talking about a whole different topic. I know. But hang on. Watch this. Watch what God says 
to them. We got the serpent, devil, Adam, and Eve. God says to the serpent, because you, what you have done, I will put enmity, is tension between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. And he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So we've got this prophetic understanding of something. Pay attention to the heel element. Okay? So there's some curses because of the sin. Some, some uh, consequences because of sin. To the woman, he said, I will make uh, the pain in your childbirth very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to your children. So there's consequences, and they had to bear the weight of that. To Adam, he said, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life, and it will produce thorns and thistles. Pay attention to those words here. And, and, and you will eat the, from the plants of the field. And so because of the consequences of sin, there are curses that are, uh, are given. And, and humanity has to deal with it until the curses are broken. Hold on to that. With that said, fast forward. Jesus shows up, lives his life, teaches us all about who God is, and, 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 and we relate to him in his human form. And then he's on the cross on that Friday, the greatest sacrifice. And his hands are nailed to the cross. Uh, Galatians and other scriptures talk about the cross um, in reference to a tree. He was nailed to a tree. Sometimes those words are interchangeable. His hands were nailed to a tree. Is it possible that, that his hands are nailed to the tree because it was human hands that stole from a tree? And he was paying the price for the curse of sin. And his feet are nailed to that cross as well. Dealing with the, that prophetic element in Genesis 3 uh, where it says that, uh, that, he, that you will strike at his feet and he will cross your head. Dealing with Jesus talking about the sin. But that, that the imagery there. While he's on the cross, it is, his side is pierced with a sword. Then there's more to that story. But, but ultimately, you think about uh, with Eve, who was taken from Adam's side, the rib. And Jesus is symbolically dealing with the curses that were given in Genesis 3. And then the crown of thorns on his head. What is that? The king of the Jews, they said. They were making fun of him, mocking him. But those thorns... From Genesis 3, the, the, the curse of the ground. And so this curse of sin, Jesus is dealing with on the cross. Galatians 3 says that Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. He took that curse upon himself for our wrongdoing. So because of sin, he has to deal with it. So that's why we have that, that, that Friday and the darkness of Saturday and his death. Is required, but but the bottom line. Remember, sacrifice gives us hope for a better future, and so Jesus is dealing with the sin of all of mankind on the cross. But of course, God has a plan; He's not done yet. There's more, and that leads us, of course, up to the uh, to the Easter story, because after that. Friday, the darkness of the Saturday, it's like, okay, all hope is lost. And sometimes it seems that way in life, doesn't it? But God has a plan. So we go to Mark 16, the story of Easter. Said it on the Sabbath day, it had ended that Saturday. Here we go, Sunday is uh, a new day. Mary Magdalene, Mary, the, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices. They were going to use them for Jesus' body. Why? Because they you use them when somebody's dead, they stay dead. Right? Not today. So very early on the first day of the week, Sunday, they were on their way to the tomb. And it was just after sunrise, Sunday morning early. And they asked each other, who's going to roll a stone away from the entrance of the tomb? And they, and they get there and they go, oh, wait a second. Somebody already moved it away. It's like, what's going on here? So they go inside expecting to see the body of Jesus. But of course, as they go in, there's this, it seemed as if like this young man dressed in a white robe. It's an angel of God sitting there on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't freak out, they, he said. That was the you know, new translation. Is, Don't freak out. He said, um, you're looking for Jesus the Nazarene. He was crucified, of course. Some of the other translations are said, said, would say that, um, you know, why are you looking for the living among the dead? It's like, well, because we thought he was dead. All hope was lost. <laughs> like, oh, no, not today. Not today. In fact, hope was born today. Because he is risen. He's alive, right? That's it. And so 
so we have this, this, that element of the story, which is critical, of course, to understand. And, 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 and the power of the resurrection is diminished a little bit if there's no sacrifice. And sacrifice is hopeless if it isn't for the resurrection. So it all comes together as Jesus died to prove that he was like one of us. He relates to us in the darkness and in the pain, suffering the curses of sin. But he also rose from the dead to prove that he was God and he conquered sin like no one else could. And so Jesus' death and resurrection are the ultimate sacrifice that brings hope for a better future. And that's why I believe so many of you come to church on a Sunday like this because you need hope for a better future. And you hear this story, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's revolutionary and, and it, it does bring us that hope. As Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is the story of Easter. Yet at the same time, it's still far off. It happened thousands of years ago. It, it has theological implications for sure. But what about you? What about the hope that you need? And how do you realize the hope that you need? How do you wrestle with that? And so we dig deeper. Over the last few weeks as a church, we've been looking at uh, Romans. It's the letter that Paul wrote to the Roman Christians in the church. And he's talking to them about Jesus and what he did and how to uh, understand all of that. We've been studying that, and we're up to chapter 12. I would just give this one verse today in Romans 12, verse 1, which gives more perspective about how we as a people can make this Easter story relevant now, even to today. So, so Paul says, if you want to realize the power of the Easter story in your life today, here's, here's the way this works. He says, I urge you, therefore, in other words, based on everything else that we've been talking about, let me urge you, and I, and, and I think this message is for you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, knowing that Jesus did what he did on the cross, you, in response, offer your body as a sacrifice pleasing to God. That is the way we worship. And that is not something that's um, happy and friendly and exciting, is it, to be a sacrifice? Fortunately, not, you know, not a permanent physical sacrifice, but a, but a living sacrifice. In view of God's mercy, if you want hope, if you want to realize the hope of Easter in your life, to become a living sacrifice, that there is no hope for the future without sacrifice, but that, that this, this is where your story intersects with God's story, with Jesus, because you cannot access the hope of Jesus without your sacrifice, and that's where this gets real. It's hard, but it's a calling beyond candy and Easter egg hunts to something significantly more, that it's a calling that's, that's difficult. But you know in your everyday life how sacrifice produces hope. So he's calling us to sacrifice. So what is it you need to sacrifice? For me, maybe you're like me. There's, you know, my stubbornness and pride. My need for comfort or pleasure. You know, you know sometimes the drama of life or my quest for happiness. My desperation for control needs to be crucified so that I can realize I hope for a better future. I've been just wrestling with that and having some, some imagery in my mind. I was, um, let me think about it th this way. <clears throat> I was thinking, I've got, you know, whether it's the, uh, the, the, the pride of life, you know, the, the lustful eyes, the greed of things that I want but I can't have, or sinful habits that I pick up along the way of chasing after pleasure, and there's probably like 30 more of these things, things that we pick up that we shouldn't be holding on to, right? And, 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 and we chase after the things of this world that, that fill us with, in the end, angst and difficulty and struggle. And, and then we realize, oh, wait, but God wants me to, God wants to give me more. You know, um, for those who are baptized today, for any of us who have been baptized, we're promised the gift of the Holy Spirit who promises to give us as gifts love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, blessing from heaven, salvation, all of that. God wants to give us the gift that's so much greater. The difficulty is, and that's where I've got my other prop. 
God wants to give me besides salvation and blessing, reward? How am I going to hold on to the, the, all of this together? I can't juggle them all, right? It's like, you know, in order for me to, to get what God wants to give, what do I got to do? I got to find a way to start setting this aside, like to sacrifice, to give up so that I can hold on to, to hold on what God wants to give me, which is so much greater. And, and a gift is easier to receive, isn't it? Yes, you can clap for that. That's fine. I'll, so it's reward, it's blessing, it's, it's the fruit of the Spirit and more. He wants to give me. And, to, and, and I receive it versus having to, to fight and wrestle and to try to, you know, chase after things that, that really don't last. And in fact, end up causing more problems. So here I am trying to hold on to this. And like a lot of us, even as believers, like, all right, God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to follow you. So I, I surrender, right? So I can hold on to the gifts that you want to give. But you know, man, there's some stuff over there. It's kind of, you know, it's tempting, right? It's like, I'm going to, you know, I, sometimes we're tempted, right? To, to pick up things. And it's like, no, no, no. It, it's living sacrifices a daily quest. Because I, I'm, I'm constantly picking up things I shouldn't have in exchange for what God wants to give. It's a, it's a journey. So the, so, the, so the sacrifice of Jesus brings us hope for a future. And, and, and we tie into that by being a living sacrifice. How? God, I want to crucify my flesh. I want to sacrifice, you know, like I said, uh, my, my, my stubbornness so that, so that I can receive what God wants for me. I can sacrifice my pride. My pride and my ego needs to die in order for me to trust God as provider. He wants to give me. You know, my, my you know, Pat, some, so many of us get into some kind of drama along the way, but my, the, you know, the need for drama in your life, you, you got to kill that so that you can receive the gift of peace that God wants to give. And my quest for happiness needs to die so that I can receive the gift of joy. I love getting good gifts. My desperation for control needs to die so that I, so, so I'm available to receive what God wants to have. And God, may you have your way with me to sacrifice, to be a living sacrifice, to surrender so that I can receive. And a sacrifice speaks of, of a hope for a better future. He's calling us to sacrifice. And unless you do, in fact, I'd say it this way, unless you have surrendered to Jesus, you're still acting like above all else, like you can hold on to and control your own salvation for eternity. And you cannot. And if you want to, hold on and stay in control of your own destiny, then you're judged for all of your actions. And God's holiness requires perfection. And I can't afford to trust myself for my own salvation. I've got to surrender in order to have hope for a future. And so in this Easter message, this, this season, it's, it's an invitation to surrender. And so as we talked about earlier with uh, so many who were baptized already uh, today as an example of that, but, but for um, all others who have been there, or, or even if you haven't yet, it's an invitation. Because this baptism idea helps wrap all of this together. Where Paul says this, and we learned this a couple weeks ago in Romans 6, that all of us who were baptized into Christ, we were baptized into his death, sacrifice. We were buried with him. Like, I, I, I surrender my life, I'm buried. My, my old life is dead. But as I come out of water, there's a new life, right? And so we're buried with him through baptism in order that just as he was risen from the dead through the glory of the Father, we may have new life. If you want to hope for a new future, it's gonna, it requires your surrender. And baptism helps us picture that. Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. For if we have been united with him in his death, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. If you want to live out the hope of Easter, it requires a sacrifice on a daily basis. That is, the greatest news about that is, when we finally get there, it opens our arms to receive so much more. 
It is a great exchange. It is well worth all that you might leave behind. Because the gift that God gives is always good. Always. So do you want that gift? And so that's why we're here. And I think my hope is that you're hearing this message with an invitation that, that Easter is not just a distant thing, but a powerful example of how we live daily. So with that in mind, I just want to encourage you to consider a couple things. We're going to do our uh, reflection time. So if you haven't been with us before, we just, before you take off and go and Easter egg hunts, family dinners, or whatever you're going to do, maybe reflect on some of this just for a moment before we go. So whether you're Flagler or New Smyrna or you're here in the room in Ormond, talk about it if you want. So feel free to talk or, or pray through it, whatever. But just a couple questions to consider. You know, what are you, what are you holding on to? that you need to surrender? And will you begin to sacrifice those parts of your life today? It's a great exchange because he fills you with so much more when you surrender. So if you want help with that, we're here for you. As a church, that's our job is to help you in this journey. If you want to be a part of a baptism service and you want to be added to the 96 today, let us know we're in. Come find one of us. And all of our campuses, we've got a sign that says, start here. That's where you go. So think about it. Talk about this. And then here in a few minutes, one of our campus pastors will come back and we'll close out our time together and tell you about what's going to happen uh, next. Start here. Be right back. <laughs>